My name is Max, um, and I'm from the University of Alabama. And I did this work with Dr. Joshua Biddle and Mahdi al Abdubro. And it's kind of a mouthful of a title. We call it Comparing Measured Driver Behavior Distributions to Results from Car Falling Models Using Sumo and Real World Vehicle Trajectories from Radar. And so a bit of background before we jump in. Um, we're really approaching this as mechanical engineers. And so we started with, you know, engine modeling and are kind of working our way up to large scale, large scale simulations. And the car flying models have always been a bit of a question to us. Um, we've worked on calibrating all the agents in our models. And so that started with actually the traffic signals and building in American style traffic signals into Sumo. And now we're tackling uh, the car flying models. And so with that, um, we start with our, our kind of our main question, and that is, can we measure acceleration in the real world and, a, and use that as a car falling model parameter in SUMO? Um, and the way we would test that is if we process SUMO trajectories in the same way that we process our radar trajectories, um, are the measured distributions the same? And so going in, first we'll go through the background, then talk about the radar data that we have. Um, then our SUMO simulation, then how we process our trajectories, and then finally results, um, future work. So I think car flying models have been mentioned a couple times now uh, in this conference. So what are car flying models and which ones do we consider? Well, um, there are several, and I don't think there's really an accepted car model, uh, car flying model to use in literature, um, but we considered several. So the first is the intelligent driver model. Um, the equation's listed here, I won't go through it, but the important thing is it has several parameters um, that are quasi-physical. Uh, the first is maximum acceleration, and this is typically defined in literature as the maximum acceleration that a driver would do in daily driving. Um, there's also a maximum deceleration, and again, this isn't the maximum deceleration ability of the vehicle itself, but rather what a driver would do. Um, further, there's a time headway parameter, so this is you know what we learned in driving school, at least in the U.S., uh, how, how closely to follow the car in front of you. Um, and then there's a desired speed as well. And uh, I didn't mention it at the beginning, but for those of you unfamiliar, a car flying model just describes how a follower vehicle uh, follows the leader. Um, and so we also considered the Krauss driver model, which is the default model in SUMO. Um, there's its equations, won't get into detail, but it too has a maximum acceleration, deceleration, time headway, and desired speed. And further, we also considered the extended intelligent driver model. Um, which was presented at a prior SUMO user conference and is supposed to have more realistic drive-off trajectories. Um, it has a longer list of equations, so we didn't list them here, but it too has maximum acceleration, deceleration, time headway, and desired speed. And so why are car flying models important? Well, they're one of the uh, essential components of traffic micro simulation. They describe how the vehicle agent moves in the, in the simulation. Um, and then coming from an emissions estimation or fuel consumption estimation uh, point of view, Acceleration, deceleration, and speed are highly influential in vehicle level emissions and fuel consumption. Um, we know that from literature and also just the you know, basic uh, vehicle modeling equations. Um, and then we also know from literature and just practice that calibration is required for model reliability, but typical traffic simulation calibration, such as based on aggregate measures like travel time or queue length or even volume-based calibration, has a non-unique solution for car following model parameters. Different sets of acceleration, deceleration, headway can lead to the same Q lengths or, or, or volumes um, or travel times. So kind of the, the answer is trajectory-based calibration. However, this requires detailed um, sub-second trajectories. Um, and it's also computationally intensive. It typically uses genetic algorithms um, and it must be ran over multiple different leader follower pairs to get a distribution of realistic uh, parameters. And so that leads us again to the question, for modelers that don't have high resolution or complete trajectory information for the network or don't wanna go through the, the trajectory-based calibration process, what should the parameter settings be? Um, and so we think that essentially it lies in intelligent transportation systems, this image off to the right, uh, it's very busy, but this is uh, one of the traffic signals in our network that we simulate. Um, and you can see the different intelligent transportation systems on there. Um, important for us is the radar, which should be highlighted uh, in red there. So that's our radar unit. Um, and these radars or cameras allow for measurement of high resolution trajectories, um, which can then be processed to hopefully 
obtain some of the car following model parameters. Um, so that's our question. And so then the, I guess our hypothesis is that if we measure the acceleration of vehicles in the network, we give that to Sumo as the acceleration parameter, then the measured distribution should be recreated. Um, and ultimately, it's really a question about are car following model parameters physical? Are they physically observed in the network or in, in vehicles driving on the road? Um, so moving on, as I was talking about the radar data, um, we have roadside radar from Innocent. Um, our overall network that we typically simulate is actually larger than this. We're just looking at one traffic light here. Um, it has two radars, and those are indicated by these half circles. Um, the radar that we're using for this work is the red shaded one, and uh, or at least the trajectories. We're also using the other radars for uh, actual network calibration. Um, but uh, these radars record vehicle velocity, position, heading, um, and other uh, statistics. Every 50 milliseconds, however, um, the network speed restrictions, we get it every 100 to 200 milliseconds for this work. Um, and the radar performs uh, onboard uh, data association and filtering and stuff. So we're kind of at a little bit higher level than typically works with radar. However, these radars do suffer from issues that roadside radars have been uh, described to suffer from in literature. So it will frequently drop valid vehicles there are also non-vehicles that are identified as vehicles. Sometimes vehicles are counted twice. Um, to deal with this, we just implemented for this work some very simple like heuristic-based filtering where we're only considering trajectories that pass completely through that red box when we go through our trajectory processing, though for the volume calibration, we're obviously considering more than that box. Um, and yeah, now jumping into our SUMO simulation, um, we simulated this two light corridor for this work. Um, so very small in comparison to what has been uh, previously presented. Um, though we do have very high resolution um, map matching and detector locations and such for this network. Um, we specifically simulated January 13th, 2023 from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. to capture the morning rush hour, um, but with actually an hour long warm up period. So really from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, the traffic and volume counts, like I alluded to, are calibrated using the radar data. Um, and on this exploded image here, you see the actual individual radar data points, and you can see that we're able to get lane level resolution. You also see a lot of the noise there um, that's filtered out with that red box. Um, doing the calibration with the two radars at traffic light one, then actually two radars at traffic light two, we achieve a, a 10 minute GEH of less than five at 94% of the location time window pairs. Um, and this is with a lot of randomness in the routes and the um, departure times. Um, the two traffic signals in there are kind of like EOS controllers in the field, and then we emulate those using the NEMA controller in SUMO. So they have the same exact parameters that the traffic lights in the field have, um, and they are um, responsive to traffic. So now moving on to how we actually process the trajectories. Down below, you see a space-time diagram of different trajectories in that red box. Um, with this red vehicle here being exploded on the on the right. Um, and there you see its velocity trace. Um, and then or yeah. so then we applied piecewise linear uh, fit to, to these trajectories to identify the ex actual accelerations and decelerations. So piecewise linear fit tries and um, optimizes the, the segment splits to maximize the R square value um, and piecewise linear fit, and then gives us a slope, which is our acceleration or deceleration. It also gives us an R squared, um, which is the goodness of fit, as well as giving us a, a um, segment time, or the time of the segment. And it's important to note that these give us basically two tuning parameters. So we can choose accelerations that have a low R squared or high R squared or, or a short segment time or a high segment time. And it creates these surfaces um, for number of vehicles, the actual accelerations that we get, um, the form our distributions. Um, and ultimately, we decided on location five for uh, the boxes aren't showing up there. Yeah, those numbers don't show up well. Um, but yeah, this, these are what the diff different distributions look like as you move around on that surface space for different minimum time and different R squared. And uh, something I forgot to mention, we're also processing the SUMO outputs, the FCD outputs from SUMO in the same exact way as we try and emulate how the radar would behave in SUMO. So right here, you're seeing the radar data, but 
After processing the radar data, we simulate with it. The SUMO output looks very similar. And then we process the SUMO output so that we can compare the distributions. Um, but moving on to calculate headway and free flow speed, um, we also use the space time diagram. And we use linear interpolation to find when the trajectories cross uh, 100, 60, and 40 meters from the stop bar. And then calculating the difference between leader and follower pairs, we get the headway. And headways outside of five seconds um, are considered outside of the car following regime and not included in our headway distribution. For free flow speed, we use this headway calculation and find vehicles that are outside of the car following regime. So we're only considering vehicles that are in free flow or do not have a leader vehicle in front of them. And then we take the um, average of their piecewise linear fit segments that have no acceleration. We also filter out vehicles um, that have an acceleration or deceleration greater than one meters per second. Ultimately, all this, when we're processing the radar data, leads to a distribution of accelerations, decelerations, headways, and speeds that we measured in the real world. And then, like I alluded to, this is now our input to SUMO. So these turn into the vehicle type distribution file input to SUMO that's kind of artistically faded out over there. Um, and like I say here, the data set wasn't large enough to consider correlation, which we know is important in car fly models. Um, but we hope to investigate that in a future work. Now over top, we see the mean values for these distributions. So the mean acceleration is 0 0.9, um, deceleration 1.4, uh, headway 2.7, and, and the cars drive on average roughly the speed limit of the network. Now kind of foreshadowing a bit, um, overlaid on this are the SUMO defaults. So this is something that we noticed early on, that the SUMO default values for these parameters are quite different than what we measure in the field. And the SUMO defaults do a good job in simulation, whereas um, I think you may guess what our values do. But uh, we'll also lay on top here a high, highly cited IDM calibration paper range. So calibration papers take these trajectories, like I said, go through some um, optimization algorithm and end up with a range of parameters. And so this was kind of noticed by us in a different work, but IDM calibration papers typically fall closer to the values that we measure um, and not near the SUMO defaults. But um, we'll see that the SUMO defaults do a, do a much better job in simulation. Um, so this is just kind of an interesting ob observation um, that we'll uh, see later. So moving on to how we actually the simulation work, we use SUMO version 1.16 um, with a 0.1 second step size, 0.2 second action step, and an hour long warm up period. Like I said, there's two default or two experiments, um, one with the default car following model parameters, and then one from the sampled from measured distributions that we then reprocess to compare to what we measured in the real world. Um, for randomness or stochasticity, we did 30 simulations per car following model and um, with a varying random seed between those, as well as sampling with a varying random seed from uh, that, di the, that distribution that I showed on the prior slide. Um, there were 360 simulations in total. And like I said, the, the SUMO FCD output was processed like the radar trajectories, and it was filtered using the same exact box. So mapping the geo coordinates to the, to the SUMO coordinates. So these are the results here um, on the right. We switched to the CDF here because it's a little bit easier uh, to view all these different distributions. Um, but important here is that the darker colors are what was measured, um, or taking what was measured and supplying that to SUMO. And then the lighter colors are the SUMO defaults. And so it's immediately clear that really none of them do a good job of reproducing what we measured in the real world. Um, they all fail to, to reproduce the empirical distributions. Um, However, the default parameters perform a lot better, especially when we look at the median values. So the Krauss default model does a really good job of almost approximating the median acceleration very well, um, as well as it's the closest in the, in the speed. Um, and then the IDM model does a, quite a good job at headway. And actually headway, the, the, the default parameters do a fairly good job of capturing like the second two thirds of that distribution. Um, and then uh, it also does a good job for the median deceleration. Um, and then like I've been saying, another I think takeaway is that the sample parameters perform poorly. It really 
we believe the root cause is the low acceleration. So when we're supplying an acceleration of only roughly 0.9 to the vehicles um, in comparison to Sumo's default value of, I think it's 2.5 or 2.6, um, that leads to unrealistic simulation, which we'll see uh, on the next slide. So here we have on the left, we have um, simulation with those sample parameters to so the low acceleration. And then on the right is the Sumo default simulation. And if we just watch it, we see a ton more congestion um, in this left simulation with these low accelerations. Uh, the queues just take so much longer to discharge. And uh, it leads to, this is very unrealistic from looking at the network and knowing what the radar data looks like. The Sumo defaults are much closer to reality. Um, so then going a bit more in depth into just comparing the defaults to the real world. Um, again, immediately clear that distributions look different, but I think it's important to note here that when simulating with the Sumo defaults, it's a homogeneous fleet. So every single vehicle has the exact same um, parameters except for speed, and that's why we believe the speed looks a little bit more normal or at least not bimodal. Um, and that's because in Sumo, the default is that there is some variation between the desired uh, driving speed of vehicles. Um, another takeaway, like I said, is that the distributions are bimodal for these homogeneous fleets. So we believe it's vehicles in the Carfon regime or outside of the Carfon regime. Um, yeah, and so um, when comparing this to, to the real world, we see that, um, I think the, the key takeaway here is that when we look at this from an energy consumption point of view or an emissions modeling point of view, um, we know that acceleration is when the vehicle is doing most of its work and consuming most of the fuel. So the fact that in simulation with the default parameters, most of the vehicles are accelerating at a much lower rate than we measured in the real world, um, we'd expect to see an underestimation of fuel consumption, though this does need to be studied further. Um, and so, yeah, like I said, um, in, in future work, one natural next step is to close the gap to do calibration. So that's um, one of our immediate next steps. We hope to investigate both the trajectory-based calibration using the radar trajectories, as well as some form of aggregate calibration. Um, and then we also have the ability to assess how these parameters change at different locations in the network or with time of day. Um, as well as then, like I was saying, estimating or assessing the impact of, of the differences on fuel consumption. And then um, also looking at how the correlated versus uncorrelated sampling of those parameters um, affects simulation. And so finally, acknowledgements. Um, we did this work uh, with support from the US Department of Energy um, and also the University of Alabama Center for Advanced Vehicle Technology. And this will be a conference paper in the proceedings. So, questions?